Managing Asia. I'm Christine Tan. On this episode of Asia's Builders, we're in Kuala Lumpur to meet Malaysian tycoon Francis Yeo, a prominent developer behind a number of swanky properties, skyscrapers and infrastructure works. In one generation, how we have multiplied uh, 55% compounded since our listing, that, that is quite unfathomable. My businesses, each has its own glory, each has its own story, and each had got a footprint to make it grow. It was a foundation building block of, of this company that today stands uh, very well. Francis Yeo, one of the most powerful and richest businessmen in Malaysia, known for his distinct personality and expensive taste. An astute entrepreneur who's closely watched for his next move. Inviting us to his home, we sought to find out more about how the billionaire amassed his fortune. Anything to do with infrastructure, uh, roads, utilities, uh, houses, hotels, these are, these are very easy stuff. First, we have the skill sets to build them well. That's a good start. You are already 20-30% ahead of the game because your capital cost is down, so your borrowing cost is down because... You're, you're, you're so you could leverage on your that, construction Your yeah, ability to be 20-30% more efficient than others. But you can manage it well. That, again, is just harnessing talents. And uh, you can own any businesses. The eldest son, he started out helping his father Yo Tiong Lei with a construction business in the 1970s. But the odds were stacked against the company. At that time, uh, politics has uh, already been very uh, prevalent. At that time, uh, do you list a company? If you list a company, you have to give to the Bumi Putra community 30% or institutions at the preferential prices. Do you do that to grow with the country? There's one local. Uh, factor. Mm. What did you do as a family? So when I came back, I, I told my father, I think we just have to be realistic. I think this country, we have to bet on this country that they are going to change for the better. And of course, with our little inputs to the government and all that, we, we, we try to grow together. But 85% uh, now of my businesses are outside Malaysia in territories that are uh, having regulatory framework that is uh, very encouraging for uh, intellectual capitals and finances that we we have. Riding on new government policies and large-scale projects, YTL cashed in on the building boom in Malaysia. The company also splurged on high-profile buyouts of shopping malls, companies and assets abroad, transforming it into a sprawling group, diversified into property and hotel development, construction and cement manufacturing. Yeah, a lot of people uh, thought we were a conglomerate. Conglomerate actually is a collection of businesses that has nothing to do with each other. We are only centered in our skill sets, our, our construction prowess. Our, we're an engineering company. So whatever we can build that can stand, we like to own that, manage that and own that. So we're just value adding our skill sets. One of Yo's most prominent works was the transformation of the Bukit Bintan district from a seedy entertainment area into a tourist shopping belt. YTL now owns and manages three luxury hotels along the Strip, as well as the newly restored Majestic Hotel A Stone's Throw Away. Tantri, we're here at the Majestic Hotel, and your latest project is to refurbish this hotel built way back in 1932. Why undertake such a project? Why is it important to you? Well, this project was very important then uh, because tourism in Malaysia was not a very big thing. It's not the second biggest earner after oil. Today it is. But in those days, the government of Malaysia asked me for some ideas. And they keep uh, complaining, why is it that the world goes to Singapore and Bangkok and doesn't come to Kuala Lumpur? So I told the government, why don't we put an Orient Express train that runs from Singapore to Bangkok two nights and 60% of the journey will be in Malaysia and owned by Malaysians, then the world will know about Malaysia. Prime Minister loved the idea, when are you going to start? <laughs> and what did you say? That was 1991 and then 1994, the train uh, started. And this project, uh, Majestic, was uh, to complement the train when they stopped. Yes. This grand 
hotels, all great. And because this hotel is strategically located as well, because it's just opposite a trail. Absolutely, like all great, uh, 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 great cities have mm. grand, grand dames. We mm. call that the Peninsula in Hong Kong, the Raffles in Singapore. KL must not lack one, so yeah. we want the majestic to be part of it. So it's all part of the grand, grand plan to make Kuala Lumpur a very viable uh, uh, tourist centre, and we have succeeded. But a big trump card for Yo has been utilities. You've once told me you like boring utilities yes. and your first big break came in 1992 yeah. when you were the first private company to yeah. be given the license to build and to operate two power plants yeah. here in Malaysia, yeah. breaking the monopoly by state utility, Tanaga National. Yeah. But that raised a lot of eyebrows. People were asking, what does a company like YTL with construction routes know about operating a power plant? Where did you find the expertise? Well, we're an engineering company, so we were confident to build. Uh, something that that can stand. As engineers, engineers, if you understand the profession, we we, we we are not allowed to speculate. We either say it can stand or it cannot. We are not like an artist that, that speculates whether something can stand or cannot. But our confidence came from our ability uh, to understand that if we could own uh, a business long term, that would be wonderful, other than just to built it. And that was how we persuaded uh, the government. Why not? Uh, this is where the regulatory framework uh, starts. Set a regulation to regulate. Was like it say. hard persuading the government? Oh, it was very difficult because most, most of the footprints uh, to do private power are only in Britain. Mm. In the US, a, a little bit. But those models don't quite really work for for Malaysia because they would insist on financing US dollars. So we had to actually come up with a 15-year bond. We invented the bond market, mm -hmm. the 15-year bond. So the idea was to use long-term money, financing and ringgit that's mm -hmm. never been done before. If we're financing in US dollars, we'd be bust by now. Mm -hmm. Like Asia went through that crisis because the US dollar uh, went up against mm -hmm. all the Asian currencies. Mm -hmm. Since then, you've acquired Wessex Water in the UK Power Sarai and Singapore and Electronet over in Australia. You know, these utilities are highly regulated by government and subject to policies. Can you actually command the prices and the rates that you want at times? How do you mitigate this risk? Well, this is exactly the difference. Uh, regulated assets are long-term in nature and it's very transparent. What I like about it is every five years there's a regulator that looks into the interest mm. of the investors and looks into the interest of the consumers and he weighs them and he makes a judgment like a Supreme Court judge and that's very transparent. Mm. If you don't like it, you can appeal. But it's not a cloak and dagger, skullduggery behind the scenes trying to fix politicians to get a better deal at the expense of the consumers. I quite like this transparent formula. Mm. So yes, uh, in a way it's not sexy. Uh, in, in terms of its returns, mm. uh, short-term returns. But it's stable. But it's stable and very sexy for long-term returns. Mm. So if you're a company that likes long-term uh, 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 revenues and profits and you don't want to subject yourself to the tyranny of quarterization, that's the business that I really love. Mm. And I'm looking for footprints of this <laughs> business everywhere. Let's talk more about that because whether it's power plants or water assets, what are you doing to further grow your utilities business? Where do you see the biggest opportunities? Well, it's not a coincidence that 85% of my businesses, our businesses are in the territories that regulatory framework is transparent like that. So Australia, Britain and Singapore, we own a third of Singapore's uh, electricity. At least they understand owning their utilities or strategic assets is not a zero-sum game. British people, uh, Singaporeans, don't are not afraid. A Malaysian owns their utility and strategically will be detriment to their interests. And we like uh, more territories, more economies around Europe and Asia to understand that. So that uh, so much money out there, and so much uh, uh, people capable of putting their intellectual capital mm -hmm. and their money to work in a proper way and to foster competition. But looking at your utilities footprint, now you have one in Australia, in the UK, and in, uh, in Singapore as well. Where do you see the biggest opportunities for you to expand, to grow your utility business? I hope uh, India, China, ASEAN will also go through that uh, process of welcoming investments in these areas. How long do you think it will take? I'm not optimistic because uh, I just came back from Davos, so there are a lot of talk about this and I've been stressing this regulatory framework is the immediate after after the capital market you must introduce the regulatory framework to allow these investments 
right? The, the, the World Trade Organization takes a little bit longer time. So you're hopeful that regulatory changes would come about so that you could own a utility business in China and India? And ASEAN. And ASEAN. Without toing and froing as a policy. So right now, they are not actually thinking about that clearly. So China has its own solution. They, they have their Huaning and their Shandongs. They can raise money, ADRs in the United States. They are doing quite, quite well in that sense. Mm. But does that mean in the long term it's good for China? Does that mean it's good for Japan? Japan uh, looked uh, great as an economy, but they never introduced competitions to, to their own utilities for a long time. And the average Japanese guy pays huge electricity costs, mm. right? So why can't they introduce competition? Seriously, there are a lot lack of money in the world to invest in this so area. So in the meantime, until they do that, your growth opportunities are limited? Is that what you're saying? In these areas, yes. In these areas of utilities, they are very highly politicized because they have not been dealt with. Because a regulatory framework like I, I advocate allows you to discuss this publicly, including the interests of the consumers. It, it means mm -hmm. politics is discussed publicly. Sure. It's, not, it's not a And that takes time. That, yeah. And that takes time, but you're willing to be patient. No, it, it, it seems the politicians don't want to discuss issues publicly. Why not? Today, you look at Europe today, there is a problem on productivity, and if you want utility prices in Europe to be at a certain price, say so, and then you set up the rules like Britain, all right? You, you bid all your power assets, and you said, there, there is, in Europe, we cannot afford to pay electricity at a certain price. We, we want to pay a certain price, and these are the terms. I'm quite sure the, the, the market will fix it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't discuss it, because you dare not discuss it, because electricity mm -hmm. prices, whoa, there's subsidies on electricity prices, this and that. Nobody dare to discuss this subject. So no solution is found to, to, uh, to, to very important utilities. It will mm -hmm. come and haunt uh, the rest of the economy one day, for sure, mm -hmm. for sure. So if, until those changes come about, you're willing to be patient as an investor? I've always been patient. There are no lack of opportunities in, the, in these three territories already. Uh, like, like I said, from airports mm -hmm. to other utilities, there are more opportunities in these areas, in these territories that I've mentioned. Uh, we'll keep looking at it. Stay with us up next. We ask YTL's Francis Yeo whether he's shopping for more acquisitions. Managing Asia will be right back. I have always hated short-termism. I've been looking ever since to try to have long-term templates. One of my shortest concessions, Australia, 200 years old, in the Electronet. That's a short concession, 200 years old. Welcome back to Managing Asia. My guest in Malaysia is the flamboyant billionaire Francis Yeo, the man who moved YTL from low-end construction to bigger things such as property development, utilities and infrastructure. YTL today is an infrastructure player with assets valued at over $17 billion. Acquisitions have been a key part of your expansion strategy. UK is familiar hunting ground for you, having acquired Wessex Water a couple of years back. What about Europe as a whole with the ongoing crisis in the Eurozone? Are there any low-hanging fruits, to use your words, that you can pick? Yeah, as you can see, uh, the regulatory framework is not as easy. If it was as easy, uh, I have lots of deals. Uh, you have table. lots of deals on the table. But not from Europe. The European deals tend to be real estate and the, the non-regulatory uh, framework type. See, because there's no, uh, fast, there's no framework to allow us to invest in our favorite areas of investment. Mm. That is the problem. And I have been uh, trying to, to, uh, to vent this idea for a long, long time. Mm. Why can't Europe? It's very attractive. Europe is actually, as a destination, is very attractive. You once said you were disappointed that financial institutions were slow in mark to market their assets on their books. Are you seeing that happen now? Still not yet. Still not yet. Again, we are living in a very fragile uh, world. I mean, if you look at the U.S., the fiscal cliff just got solved. But that that tells you, if you take off so much money from the top bracket, hundreds mm -hmm. of billions, and then to to slash. Uh, financing, deficit financing to prevent that. Uh, that's going to cost U.S. not to have a huge growth. Europe mm. is still struggling uh, now. But there's a lot of money in the world to invest in their utilities in uh, Europe. Europe is so investable if the framework follows through. But it is not at the moment. That's quite sad. 
Hmm. Let's talk about China. A lot of people are surprised that you don't have a bigger footprint in China. You have a cement plant near Shanghai and you also have a shopping center in Chengdu. What's holding you back from expanding too quickly in China? Again, uh, in shopping and in, uh, in uh, cement, these are uh, non-regulated assets. In, in, the, in that sense, non-utility that I mentioned direct with, 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 with that needs regulatory framework mm -hmm. and thinking. Those are easy because everybody is allowed to are allowed in the world to invest in them. So of course we are there. But we would love to invest in utilities in China, in water, in, in, in power, in transportation. Mm -hmm. If you are allowed to invest in Britain, like Thames Water, why don't you yourself set up a regulatory framework like that of Britain? to allow the world to invest in your airports mm. the same as you would invest in other people's airports or, or water facilities. Why won't you allow the world to invest in your water facilities the same way as people are allowing you? And I think if every Asian economy, big ones, Japan, China, Indian, ASEAN, thinks like that, I think it would be a better uh, preparation for the future economic uh, strength of sustainable mm. growth for the Asian economies. Mm. If we are not prepared, one day we will face this economic nationalism again. Sure. Just like Europe. Mm. And you are going to find when you need the solution most, there's no regulatory framework to allow you to do that. Mm. So apart from utilities in China, which you would like to get into, but that requires regulatory changes, yeah. what other deals in China would you like to grab if the opportunity came up? I think China is a very tough uh, territory because Why the whole world that? wants to invest in China. It's a very compelling market, um, especially in the consumption side, right? So I would definitely not take my eyes off uh, the consumption. I would, I would definitely uh, still uh, on old-fashioned real estate shopping centers. I would still be very interested to look mm -hmm. at that, mm -hmm. and we'll pace along and hopefully China will allow their utilities to be opened up. Can you imagine? the opportunities when China opens up. And, and China needs to do that. If China opens up, it would be the leaven for the whole of Asia to open up. There are signs the economic growth is actually picking up. Are you worried about a bubble in China? On the property side, it will always be a bubble of sorts because that's how inflation is manifesting through properties. When you have quantitative easing, inflation is going through properties. At all the time, you have to curb properties because that's where it will grow naturally. That's because there are no other avenues for the money to grow. It's the natural area that, that money will go to. You clearly want YTL as a whole to be a dividend yield play, but there's a lot of talk about privatization at the moment of some of your listed entities. What transformation plan do you have in mind for the entire group? We have already privatized cement and it went very well for YTL Com. Mm. What we were trying to do was people uh, are saying, hey, YTL, you know, we love your story and all that, but your subsidiary is a bit too small, so we, we can't invest in all your subsidiaries. So, so in a way, the, the sum of the parts of all my subsidiaries are so undervalued. So I said, okay, if nobody wants any of my subsidiary, I'll take it back. That, that, that's all it is. You've taken one back. Any plans to take the rest back? Yeah, I want to own as, as much of my own company as possible, because these are great companies. Sure. So there's no need to actually list it anymore if mm. the public doesn't want to pay a price for it. Mm. In the past when we were growing, uh, people were willing to pay a premium for our story. But right now, uh, people are not willing to do that. So if you're not willing to do that, then the equity is not going to be cheap, is it? Yeah. So long term wise, we know the prospects of these companies are very good. So these are all part and parcel of the whole thing. There's more with Malaysian tycoon Francis Yeo in just a moment. Managing Asia, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Managing Asia. From a cabaret and amusement park in the 1950s, my guest today revived this area into a bustling shopping belt. It was the same business savvy that he transformed the family company into one of the largest conglomerates listed in Malaysia. You inherited the construction company from your father. Today, YTL has come a long way. It's still very much a family business. Various family members are still working within the group. Our family members, their expectations, are they harder to manage? Do they expect more out of you? One of the uh, greatest joy that I have is that the, the, the fourth, uh, I am the, uh, fourth, the fourth generation 
are very smart. All of them went to Oxford, Cambridge, all the best universities, LSEs, and, uh, and they've all graduated with, f with flying colors. That shows the foundation that has been built. They, they understand meritocracy. They mm -hmm. understand that nobody's mollycoddling them. You, you cannot go to Oxford or Cambridge, all the best universities, without you making an effort. So they all understood what's this calling, and they've all qualified. So the you all get along? Oh, we love each other. So love is the core uh, glue. And there are no disagreements? Of course there will be uh, <laughs> robust discussions on certain issues. Robust discussions. Yeah. You call it robust. Oh, yeah. But never out of a personal agenda. Mm -hmm. It's always for the common good. Be a force for good. So, and then we always get consensus at the end of the day. You're 58 years old. You're still a key driving force behind White here. Have you thought about succession planning? Yes, the succession planning is natural for public organizations. You have to make sure that... And what is yours? we always done it. In fact, all the, uh, the different divisions, all the different businesses are led by CEOs, which are not family, majority of them. I used to lead them on a daily basis mm -hmm. as an MD. But as time, as time went by, as our business grew so many fold, we appoint uh, CEOs from the outside, the best talents in the world. Wing has got 21 patents on 4G, for example. John Ng, CEO of Saraya, is one of the best brains in uh, utilities. So you are yeah. open to leadership outside? Already, already. And, and uh, my family and the future generations would have to compete to be CEOs, uh, you know, to, to be that granular in, in if, if they want to lead companies. So they understand that. They're, so they are being tutored today. They are, yeah, under the shadows, uh, learning from uh, all these great uh, mm. mentors of the US. Mm. We don't see many issues of succession. It's already being planned in that way. Mm. Yeah. You've been ranked as one of the most powerful and influential businessmen here in Asia, and you've won many awards. How would you describe your leadership and your management style? Well, I'm not as influential as, uh, as people make it out to be because there's still only three territories with regulatory <laughs> framework that, that allows the YTL's intellectual capital and transparency to thrive. But uh, the leadership is about uh, personnel of YTL, must understand and master three languages. The language of God that leads to integrity and morality. The language of man, the articulation of what you actually do. You are a force for good articulated, that you are there to make life better for everybody. And then the language of machines, the digital language, zero and one. Mm -hmm. You have to harness technology. Then you become relevant in that order. And that's why through all these, uh, since our leadership, when I took over in 88, I have very little issues because if we stick to this simple basic template of getting people to understand the long-term uh, vision of the company. Is it hard to find those people? Well, it's hard in one sense because uh, other industries are paying a lot more uh, through the short term because up to 208 they were rewarding short termism. Mm. So they are way overpriced. But now it's more balanced with the world after 208. People are rethinking about this. Now there are regulations to prevent greed, there's clawback. It's not solving again. If you want very smart people, young people in the banking industry, uh, they're like footballers, you know, they have a certain lifespan. You can't curb their enthusiasm, right? You have to reward them properly, but with a clawback provision. But if you try to take off the rewards of the young people's brains, that's not right either. It's not the correct thing, it's not natural. But to reward them instantaneously, as what they did, also causes Sounds problems. Sounds like a huge challenge. Yeah, I mean, this is a perpetual challenge of, uh, of values. You know, that's what I mean. In our business, we don't have got mavericks. We, we don't have CEO, there are mavericks like that that will push the company to jeopardy mm -hmm. and, and lose billions of dollars. If you have a certain culture that has a long-term view and for the good of the customer, a force for good, mm -hmm. and if they understand it, I have less and less of these headaches. <laughs> With so many cycles of economic implosions, as you can see, we grew stronger. Mm -hmm. so you just have to wait. I just have to wait and I know I will succeed. Mm -hmm. I know I will succeed, mm -hmm. right? Victory is never in doubt. Patience sometimes <laughs> it needs a virtue that needs to be tempered and, yeah. and, and, and nurtured. And that was Francis, your managing director of YTL based here in Malaysia. Hope you've been enjoying this special series on Asia's builders. Join us again next week for more leadership insights here on Managing Asia. I'm Christine Tan. Thanks for watching. Managing